Okay, so we're ready to begin with the second talk of the day, and this will be given by John Pardon, who's presently at Princeton University. Uh, John is among, I'd say, the youngest of the speakers, uh, being a present Clay Fellow, uh, and also recently the recipient of a Packard Fellowship and the uh, Waterman Prize from the National Science Foundation, which is a large prize. Uh, he works in geometry and topology and has uh, done a number of important works, in, including resolution of a problem of Gromov while still an undergraduate. Uh, so John will regale us on this. Thank you very much. It's uh, an honor to be here. Um, and it's, uh, uh, and, and to be part of the uh, celebrating the Clay Math Institute. I'm, I'm very grateful for the support I've, I've received um, from CMI. So I'd like to tell you uh, today about uh, smoothing finite group actions on three manifolds. OK, so uh, just to begin with um, some definitions. So we consider uh, group actions on manifolds, say M is just a, um, say a smooth manifold, really it just has to be a topological manifold. Um, the groups are all finite. Uh, for this definition, I guess we could take G a Lie group if we wanted to. Um, so the action is called tame if there's some smooth structure with respect to which the action is smooth. Um, so it's a uh, purely topological uh, notion. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't care about any sort of background smooth structure on M that you might have uh, been given in the first place. And actions which aren't tame are called wild. Um, so it's sort of silly to consider this notion if M doesn't have any smooth structures at all, then, then every action is wild, um, even the trivial action. Uh, here, here's a slightly more uh, interesting example. So suppose you have a topological manifold closed topological manifold with no smooth structure, um, but which has a finite cover, which does have a smooth structure. Uh, so the examples of these things exist using uh, smoothing theory in, in high dimensions, dimensions uh, four and, and often in higher dimensions as well. Um, so then I claim this the action of the deck transformation group on the covering um, is wild. Let me just. So why is this? Well, uh, if you have a smooth structure on M tilde, which was invariant under G, you get a smooth structure on the quotient, which we assume not to exist. OK, great. Um, so that's, um, there, there, there are plenty of wild actions in high dimensions, even ones which are free. So, so locally, there's. Um, there's nothing wrong with this action at all. It's a free action. Um, and in, in very small dimensions, all actions by finite groups are tame. OK, so now, um, now I want to concentrate on dimension three. So um, and, and start with an example of a wild group action. So we consider the Alexander Horn sphere. Um, I've given similar talks before where I forgot to put in a, a picture and then I had to either draw this on the board or try to explain it with my hands. But um, maybe I'll try to explain it with my hands also. Anyway, so you start with a sphere, um, you branch out two arms from it. Um, they come in, they don't touch, they come in in class, but each, they come in to almost touch. Each of them uh, sprouts two fingers, which do this loop, then they almost touch here and here, but not quite. Um, and you keep this iterating this process infinitely many times. So, so this Alexander Horn sphere, it's S2 inside um, R3. It divides the space into, into uh, two halves, the interior and the exterior. The interior um, is completely standard. It's a, uh, an open, open three ball. In fact, it's a closed three ball. Um, the exterior is not. So if you like, take this red loop, um, it, it does not bound a disk um, in the complement of, of the Alexander Horn sphere. 
um, even though if you, if you took a standard sphere in R2, every, um, every loop disjoint from the sphere would, would bound the disk. Okay, so so the, 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 the exterior is not simply connected. Um, its boundary is just the two-sphere. So, so it's, although it's, it's, it's some topological space, its boundary um, is, is a two-manifold. Its interior is a three-manifold, but it's not a manifold with boundary. Um, okay, so we have this sort of strange space X. I'll call it X, the exterior of the Alexander Horn sphere. Boundary is the sphere, uh, the two-sphere. Um, and I want to, well, Bing doubles this space. So take two copies, glue them along their common boundary. Um, and the surprise is that um, you actually get back the three sphere. Okay, so, so if, if we believe for a second this theorem, then there's an action of Z mod two on the space. You just flip the, uh, the two copies of X and and I claim this is a wild action. So, so why is it a wild action? Well, the fixed set um, is this common boundary. That's just a two-sphere. So that's, that looks all right. There's, there's nothing um, uh, wild about that. But, um, but it's wildly embedded in, in S3. The complement um, has infinitely generated fundamental group. Uh, because it's just two copies of the co exterior of the Alexander Horn sphere. Okay, well, on the other hand, if you have a smooth involution, the fixed set is always a smooth submanifold, which has, has, uh, has reasonable bound complement. Okay, so, so that's what I just said. This, this action is therefore wild. Okay, so, so just to contrast this um, with this example, um, this is a free action. So locally, um, there's no problem smoothing it. Um, on the other hand, in this, this example, um, we, uh, we found that it was wild by, um, by looking at what the fixed set is. Um, and that's where the wildness comes from, how it, um, how it behaves near the fixed set. OK, so um, I, want to, um, I want to explain some of uh, the, the reason behind uh, this homeomorphism uh, that being of being this at y, x, y, this double of x is the three sphere. So, so let's consider um, what's called the Bing doubling operation. So, we start with, um, so let's look at this middle link here. Um, this, is the, this is a link inside a solid torus, two component link inside a solid torus. Um, so given any knot, um, I can take a tubular neighborhood of that knot um, and then map this solid torus containing the two component link onto that tubular neighborhood of the knot um, and look at what I get. So this is called a Bing doubling operation. If I start with the unknot, I just, I just get, this, um, get this link B1. If I do this um, operation again, so I Bing double each of, each of the components of B1. I get this, this second link, B2. And we can just uh, keep iterating this, this procedure. OK, so then, then what, uh, what, what I claim is that, um, so oh, you take, take tubular neighborhoods now of each of these components. Uh, so I want to take some sort of limit. Um, if you just think of the knots themselves, it's maybe, maybe not so clear how to define the limit. But if, if you just take their nested tubular neighborhoods, then you just take this intersection of all of them. So, the, so I'll call that the, the limit. Um, and and this, is, this intersection turns out to be homeomorphic to um, the Cantor set cross an interval. So, so why is that? So imagine. Um, Imagine like the horizontal plane um, in a, on, on each of these uh, pictures uh, like this. So, so the picture is obviously symmetric with respect to the whole reflection across this horizontal plane. Now the horizontal plane intersects N in the Cantor set. This is clear from the construction. Um, 
Now, now how would I, um, so now, now what do I want to do? I want to ex express n as sort of a one parameter family of these Cantor sets. So you can, at least locally in the neighborhood of the plane, we'll just move the plane up and down. This gives you this one parameter family of Cantor sets. Now you'd like to move this plane all the way, all the way up. It sort of gets stuck uh, when you, on, when, when you arrive here at these, at these linked components. Um, but, okay, so, so you can imagine, let's see if I can draw something. So, so you want to move this, move this plane up. You get stuck on this link, uh, but now you're, but of course, uh, now your, your next stage, uh, you just do this. Okay, so you're, you're, you're converging to the Alexander Horn sphere as you do this. Okay, so it, it, it follows that, um, this essentially shows that uh, this, so um, you, can, you can present this double of the exterior of the Alexander Horn sphere in the following way. You take uh, the set N, that's homeomorphic to a Cantor set across the interval, and you just collapse all the intervals. Okay, so uh, th this is more or less, an, no, no, nothing really serious has happened so far. We're just giving another presentation of the, of the space. Um, the content, the real content of this um, homeomorphism here is in the following proposition, which I, I, uh, I won't explain the proof of, but, but let me just explain what it says. So start with the unknot inside the solid torus and do uh, many, many Bing doubles. So, so what Bing proves in a completely explicit way is that um, if you Bing double enough, then, um, then you can find an isotopy of that link which puts all the components um, uh, into sets of very small diameter. Of course, if you just do the, the Bing doubling, like I've drawn it, all the, all the components have a big diameter no matter how many times you, you Bing double. Um, but if, if, you, if you bing double enough, then, then you can isotope the link so that all, all the components have small diameter. Okay, and then, then, then by some sort of general results also of bing, that means that, that when you do this quotient, you actually don't change the, the homeomorphism type. Okay, so that's... Why are you doubling the x? Yes, you would get this three sphere. Then, so yes, the uh, the double of the three ball is the three sphere. But then, then the involution you get is just the standard involution. The in the, in the interior is just the interior is just standard. There's there's nothing wild about it. it's somehow the, it's it's wildly embedded in in the three sphere. But no. okay, so so this this reasoning here. Um, so not only does it, does it give you this wild involution, it also exhibits it as a, as a limit of smooth involutions. So, so how is that? Well, these, these Bing doubles, they all have this symmetry I just said, reflection across a, a horizontal plane. Um, and if you then apply this isotopy that takes all the components to sets of really small diameter and conjugate your, your, um, your original standard involution, you get, an, um, you get another involution fixing a, a very complicated two-sphere, the, the image of, the two, of this horizontal two-sphere under, um, under this isotopy, which takes all the components of the link to sets of very small diameter. Um, and and as, as, you, um, as you take the limit, this, these involutions you get converge to the, the wild involution. Okay, so, so this, is, this is just the first example. There, there are a number of examples 
uh, constructed later using similar ideas. Um, and you can get the fixed set to be also a wildly embedded knot, not, not only a wildly embedded surface. OK, so, so the um, uh, result I want to talk about is that, um, that this, this procedure essentially gives you, um, gives you all the examples. So if you have any finite group action on a, on a smooth three-manifold, then, then it, you know, it's a uniform limit of, of smooth actions. Um, so there, there are some mathematicians who can be sure that they've proved a theorem before they've written it up, um, but, but I'm not one of them, and I've not written the proof of this theorem. So that's, that's, why, the, well, that's why it says in progress. Um, but I'll, I'll explain some of the proof. And, um, OK, so, so some remarks. This is um, naturally been asked some time ago. Um, obviously, it's of interest only for wild actions. If you have a tame action, then it's easy to smooth it. So uniformly close does not mean um, they're conjugate. That's, that's pretty clear from, from any example of, a, of say, say, from Bing's example. You have a smooth involutions, which are completely standard. They're tame. They're converging to this wild involution, which is not conjugate to the standard um, involution. Um, so, So, so this doesn't say anything about anything new about existing examples. All, all the existing examples of, the, at least as far as I know, of, of wild group actions are, are defined as uniform limits of smooth actions. Um, so, so instead, it simply uh, says that all this this procedure for, for this construction we have is is the only way to way to do it. Okay, and e even this corollary, if, if G admits a faithful action by homeomorphisms and admits faithful action by diffeomorphisms um, doesn't seem to be um, known otherwise. Okay, so I'll, I'll talk about um, the proof of this. Okay, so the beginning is Smith theory. So I'll just um, talk about Smith theory in dimension three, but this is something which can be applied in a much much more generally. Um, right, so, so let's look at um, periodic period P homeomorphisms of a manifold. So Smith proved that the fixed set has to be a topologically, topological manifold. Okay, I didn't say the dimension has to be constant, but somehow you, you, you can't have, say, the Cantor set as, um, as the fixed set. Uh, of a periodic uh, homeomorphism. Okay, so so what Smith what Smith really proved is that it's a homology Zeeman P homology manifold, um, and that's that's the correct statement in higher dimensions. But in in dimension three, topology is simple enough um, that Zeeman P homology manifold and um, actually implies that you're a topological manifold in the, in these dimensions. Okay, so moreover, um, you can only have two-dimensional components of this fixed set when P is two. So when, um, when your homeomorphism is actually an involution, and, um, and it has to exchange the two sides of your fixed set. So, I mean, why, why should you think this is true? Well, if you have a surface, okay, if you have a tamely embedded surface in a three manifold, clearly it locally divides the space into, into two halves. Um, this, is, this is still the case for, for any, um, for, for a wild embedding also. Um, so, okay, so your homeomorphism, so suppose you fixed some. Suppose this is the fixed set of your homeomorphism of order P. You mean one component of the fixed set? 
Yes, so I'm, I'm just drawing a local picture. So suppose you have a, a surface. Yeah, so, so, so this is um, near some point. OK, now suppose uh, that G did not exchange. Uh, suppose that sigma didn't exchange the two sides of, of this fixed set. Um, well, then you could just redefine uh, new involution, tau. So tau is sigma on u and the identity on v. So this, this is if sigma does not exchange the two sides. OK, but now you're in trouble because sigma is, tau is also of order p. Um, and, um, and now its fixed set is, is, is this half space, which is not a manifold. So this implies p is equal to 2, and, and, it, and, and it flips the two sides. Okay, so this gives us at least a coarse local understanding. Um, but of course, remember these, these topological manifolds, the fixed sets could be wildly embedded. Um, now note that I, I haven't said anything about um, actions by anything other than cyclic groups. So if I took, say, an action by z mod p cross z mod p and looked at the locus fixed by, fixed by that group, um, I don't know whether that can be a, a counter set or not. I, I suspect it cannot, and I suspect it follows from, from essentially from Smith theory, the same, same as this does, but I haven't, um, haven't seen that statement. Okay, but we're only going to need this uh, for cyclic groups of prime order. Okay, so uh, to smooth a group action, uh, we'll, we'll just uh, do it in some, a few different stages. So first, I'll smooth it um, over the action, over the locus where, it, where the action is free. So um, next, there's the open set where the stabilizer is either trivial or Z mod 2 and uh, locally fixing a surface. OK, and then there's the rest. So, so first we smooth it over the locus where the action is free. Um, so this is, the, there, there's, this is essentially um, an easy application of uh, Bing and Moise's theory of smoothing for three manifolds. So I gave this example at the beginning of the talk where of, a, of a wild free action in high dimensions. And the reason you could have such a thing is because um, Smoothing, there, are, there are obstructions to smoothing high dimensional um, topological manifolds. But in, in three dimensions, you can smooth anything, anything you want. Um, so that basically mean, outlaws this example. And, and in fact, you can, you can just show any, any free action has to be smoothable either very easily. Um, smoothing over this called the reflection locus, uh, where, where you allow um, stabilizer to be Z mod 2 uh, fixing a surface. This was, um, this was basically due to crags in 1969 using, using a result of Bing. So I'll explain that too. Okay, and then there's the last step where you smooth, smooth over the remaining part. Okay, and, and by Smith theory, the, re the, the remaining part um, is in the union of one manifolds. Okay, so, so this step three uses this uh, lattice of incompressible surfaces. Okay, great. So, so let me just uh, begin with uh, uh, step one. Okay, so we suppose uh, we have a free action. So it's a free action, so the quotient's nice. It is also a manifold. It doesn't have a smooth structure, but it's a topological manifold. Bing and Moise tell us it has a smooth structure. It's smoothable. Um, so we can pull that structure back to the cover, M. So M also has, um, has a smooth structure. Of course, it's different from the, the one we started with. 
um, but it has the virtue that the group action is now smooth with respect to it. Okay, so Bing and Moise not only showed that every topological three manifold has a smooth structure, they, they show that homeomorphisms can be approximated by C0 approximated by diffeomorphisms. So now we look at the, the identity map, uh, which you usually think of as smooth, but, but with um, but we put different smooth structures on the, on the domain and on the target. So the, the, the domain has the original smooth structure that we care about. The target has the smooth structure which we constructed uh, to make the action of G smooth. Um, and Bing and Moise tell us that, that there's actually a, a, a diffeomorphism close by. So now we just use, uh, we just use phi to pull this action back. We have a smooth action of G on MS, this new smooth structure, um, and we pull it back, conjugate by, by phi. And, and now, now we get a smooth action um, on our manifold. Okay, great. So, so I, I sort of made this global assumption that the whole action was free everywhere, I assume, phrase this argument as if m free were e equal to m. That's, that's, not, uh, that's not a problem because um, you just sort of uh, may, require everything to be the identity um, on, on the locus, uh, which is not free. Okay, so now let me explain this uh, result of Craggs, which deals with the case of involutions fixing a surface. So again, one, one, one can make this argument completely locally, but I'm going to pretend that, um, I'm going to just pretend that my, my group is Z mod two and its fixed set is, is, a, is a two manifold, possibly wildly embedded. So um, the key point um, in, this, in this proof of Craggs is, is the following result of Bing which has sort of a similar flavor to the, the result we're proving. It says that any possibly wildly embedding, wild embedding of a surface um, has a tame re-embedding which is close to the identity. So, so again, it's saying uh, tame objects are, are dense. So you can, you can see zero approximate any any embedding with a tame embedding. Okay, and, and moreover, it's unique up to small isotopy. So, so maybe more precisely, for every epsilon, there's a delta such that um, any two tame re-embeddings which are delta close to the identity are um, epsilon small isotopic. Great, so let's, um, Let's use this to smooth an involution. So we start with M sigma. That's, that's the fixed set. It's a wildly embedded surface in our three manifold. And Bing tell, that's, that's, this, uh, that's this black curve. And Bing tells us that there's a tame re-embedding nearby. That's this red curve. Now, of course, the red curve is probably not fixed by, by our involution. Actually, I shouldn't be saying curve, it's a surface, but I've illustrated it as a curve. So we have, um, we have the re-embedding, and we have its image under the involution, which is different. But of course, uh, by Bing's result, there, there's an isotopy between the two. Okay, so, so let's, let's call that isotopy alpha. So it's the identity far away, and, and it moves I of M sigma to sigma of I of M sigma. I guess the reverse, the way I've written it. Okay, so now we can just define our involution uh, by this formula, uh, but maybe I'll explain it in the pictures too. So what do we do? So first, okay, we start with um, this picture. We want to define an involution whose fixed set is, is the tame re-embedding, I of M sigma. 
So let's just draw that. So first, we apply sigma. That's fine, far away from the fixed set. Uh, near, the fix, near, the, near, well, near the desired fixed set, uh, it's not so good because it doesn't fix the thing we want to, to fix. Um, OK, of course, I've, um, I've mislabeled the figure. This is, this is u, and that's, so it's, this is sigma of u down here and sigma of v up here. Sigma flip reverses the two sides. OK, so first we apply sigma, and then we apply alpha to move, um, to move this alternative tame re-embedding back to the, the one we want. OK, so that gives us a homeomorphism from, from this left uh, picture to the right picture, swapping, uh, swapping u and v. And away from, away from this picture, it's an involution. Now, near the picture, uh, it's actually not an involution. Um, but that's, that's easy to fix. You just, um, you just take what I described as the map on one half, and on the other half, you take its inverse. Right, so this is, this is our, our new involution, sigma tilde, and now the fixed set is, is I of M sigma. All right, so crack, this, is, this is essentially, well, the, the, this is uh, Craig's argument. In fact, Craig's, Craig's further showed um, I think a, a, a local connectedness result about the space of all involutions uh, fi fixing a surface. This was only just, just the beginning of his paper. OK, great. Yes, the fixed set of <coughs> sigma tilde is, is what we want it to be. Ah, yes, and then I should say one more thing. We didn't smooth the action. We, we just tamed it. We made the fixed set tame. Um, but I didn't say anything about smoothing it. Um, you smooth it using step one. So now the quotient is a three-manifold with boundary. Um, and, and you just say exactly the same thing you did um, on the previous slide. OK, so now I want to um, smooth this action over, over the rest. So we'll su suppose it's smooth over the locus uh, where it acts freely and where it locally fixes a surface uh, with, with Z mod 2 isotropy. So x is going to be uh, the rest. That's the part where it's not smooth. And this is, uh, this is what I claim. By Smith theory, uh, this, this uh, bad locus is essentially one dimensional. It can be covered by manifolds of dimension 0 or 1. Uh, so, so why is this? Oh, I suppose x is in this, this set. What does that mean? It means, OK, either your stabilizer um, has order greater than 2, or your stabilizer has order exactly 2, and and locally, it fixes a curve or a point, not, not a surface. OK, so if your, order has, if your stabilizer has order exactly two and, and you, um, the fixed set is locally either a point or a line, um, possibly wildly embedded in the, in the latter case, um, then, then clearly, by definition, it's, it's in this union. If you have order greater than two, well, OK, if you have order greater than 2, then consider the, the subgroup which preserves orientation there, the subgroup of the isotropic group acting by orientation preserving homeomorphisms. That's index at most 2, and hence has to be non-trivial. Now you find a, an element of prime order there, and, um, and then you're in the fixed set of that element of prime order, which, which is exactly what we're taking the union of. OK, so, so do some elementary group theory analysis. We see that Smith theory tells us that the, um, the locus, which is not dealt with by either um, 
uh, Bing Mois or, or Craggs, um, is in this union, essentially one dimensional. Okay, so the corollary is that these um, spaces have, have covered dimension the most one, and that, that's all I, I really uh, need to know here. Okay, so in covering dimension most one, that means they're arbitrarily fine covers with no triple overlaps. I think I have a, a picture here. Okay, I'll the cover is on the next slide, I guess. Okay, so, so um, here's X. It's essentially one dimensional locus. It's a union of one manifolds. I don't know anything about how they intersect. They could intersect in counter sets. That's, um, that's okay. But I can take an invariant neighborhood with smooth boundary. Because on the complement of X, my action is smooth. Okay, so basically we're, we're going to forget about the rest of the manifold and concentrate on, on this neighborhood and try to do the smoothing there. Right, now, now we're going to use crucially the fact that this is, um, has covering dimension one. We can find fine covers with only double overlap. So I've, I've drawn here on this set A on the left, this neighborhood of X. On the right, this is a covering. I have a covering by, I guess, seven sets. And you see there, there are only double overlaps. So our goal now is we want to, um, we want to cut up this manifold A into pieces, do some, um, do some operation on each of the pieces to smooth the action and then glue them back up. Okay, so we'll just cut along, along surfaces in each of the double overlaps. And then the pieces that we get will be in, in bijection with the elements of the open cover. Now let me say a little bit about what, why, why, why do we need to do this? Why do we need to cut up A? Why don't we just um, approximate the group action on A directly? So what's, um, what's happening here on, on each of the pieces, or, or on A itself, we have an action uh, by homeomorphisms. We're just going to forget um, that, in fact, it's an action by homeomorphisms. We're just going to uh, regard it as an action uh, by homotopy equivalences. So, so we have our map, our action. Map from G to homeomorphisms of A. So, we just compose and, and care only about homotopy equivalences. Now, in, in favorable cases, so this is very much uh, not true in general. Um, but for instance, if A were, say, a closed hyperbolic manifold, then, then this is the same. Um, as, as the isometry group. Um, and this is nice, nice smooth action. On the other hand, when we do this procedure, we have no, no control over, over, over the action we get. It might not be anywhere close to the action we started with. So that's why we want to cut up A into these pieces. The action um, on each of the pieces might be nowhere close to the original action, but if we make the pieces small enough, it doesn't matter. Okay, so that's, um, that's the picture. Find these surfaces in each of these pairwise uh, overlaps and cut along those surfaces. Okay, great. So, so how do we find surfaces which are invariant under a group action? So I want to consider um, each, each double intersection. So each intersection, ui cap uj, has sort of has two ends. One of them 
In one of the ends, you, you limit towards ui, and the other end, you limit towards uj. Um, you can't limit to a uk, because if you limit it to uk, well, uk is open, um, so then you'd have a triple overlap. You can only, li only limit to either ui or uj. So you look at the, the surfaces which uh, separate these two ends. Um, and are somehow minimal in a certain precise sense. Okay, so now, now that you've visualized this, I'll put the picture up. Suppose we have UI on the left, UJ on the right. That's the intersection. We look at surfaces like this. Now you see there's a natural partial order on this set. You say, say um, F is less than or equal to G if it's closer to, say, the, the I end than the G, J end. Um, right, now I, I, I want to consider isotopy classes. Um, so the order relation is you know, F is less than or equal to G if and only if you can find isotopy classes, uh, representatives of their isotopy classes, if and only if you can deform them such that they're, they're as in the picture. Okay, so one, one can check that this is actually a, a partially, partial order. Um, Oh, the, the, the non-trivial thing to check is anti-symmetry. If, if f is less than or equal to g and g is less than or equal to f, then they're isotopic. Great. Now the, now the, real, um, the real result here is that this poset is a lattice. So that is every finite subset has a, has a least upper bound and, and, and the greatest lower bound. So this proof was, uh, uses minimal surfaces as the proof suggested by Ian Egel. Uh, so, so when I was thinking about the Hilbert-Smith conjecture, I you know, was, had some idea, and it was, it was clear it would, it would, would work if, if this was indeed a lattice. Uh, it seemed to me it was rather unlikely to actually be a lattice, but, um, but Ian Eagle said, said uh, gave, this, gave this proof I'm, I'm going to uh, summarize. Okay, so, so the point is uh, to, use, okay, again, use area minimizing surfaces. So surfaces under these topological assumptions and compressible have uh, unique well, they have, they have area minimizing representatives. And there's this uh, great property by Friedman, Hass, and Scott. The area minimizing representatives, um, if they can be, so if you have two surfaces, if they can be isotoped to be disjoint, then their area minimizing representatives are, are already disjoint. Um, and, and the Let me just explain why that's true in two dimensions. The proof in, in three dimensions is much, much more involved. But um, suppose I have two geodesics on the surface, um, which can be isotoped to be disjoint. So clearly, you can, you can move these curves away from each other. Um, I claim this can't happen. Why can't it happen? Well, there, okay, we, have, we have here two paths from between these two points. You can go either this way or that way. One of them is shorter. Um, and that means either the blue curve or the green curve is not, um, not, area minimi not, not length minimizing, because you can take a shortcut on one of them. Okay, and then you have to think a little bit further of what if, what if they have the same length. But, but, but it works in that case, too. Um, right, so, so what is the, the upshot? If you use um, these area minimizing representatives for every element of this um, collection of isotopy classes, you choose its area minimizing representative. These simultaneously realize all the order relations in the poset. 
So this is something which was not, um, not at all obvious from the definition. Uh, I sort of expect there is a completely topological proof, but it, I, 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 it's, it's definitely a non-trivial property, uh, which relies crucially on being in, in three dimensions. Okay, so, so once you have this, you, you get the lattice property essentially for free from the fact that you can choose representatives simultaneously realizing all the order relations. Okay, and the lattice property also gives you almost for free that you have um, invariant elements of these lattices. So, so why is that? Okay, so you start with, um, start with an arbitrary uh, collection of elements here. You take their orbit under the group, um, and then that's, uh, that's some collection um, of, of surfaces, and then you take the least upper bound of the orbit. Okay, so may maybe, you have to, um, maybe you have to think a little bit harder if, um, if you have two open sets and your group action flips, um, re reverses them, then, um, then the action on this lattice is, is order, order reversing. Um, but that's, that's okay. Okay, great. Okay, so I, I need to, um, in order to justify uh, what I'm gonna say next, I need to discuss uh, various notions of group actions. So we had, uh, we, we constructed in the previous slide um, these surfaces, but they're not G invariant on the nose, they're G invariant up to isotopy. So when you cut along them, you don't get an honest G action on each of the pieces, you just get an action up to homotopy. Um, and there are a few things I could mean by that. Um, Oh, so I'm going to call these, I don't know whether this is standard terminology. Um, okay, so let's say a, a level zero action is just a collection of elements phi of g uh, for every g and g. Um, that's not much of an action. I didn't say anything about composition. Level one action, this maybe actually deserves the name action a little bit more. Um, that just means elements. Uh, such that it satisfies composition up to isotopy. So, so, so this, is, um, this is essentially just a, a map from g to pi zero of diff. So this is, I'll, I'll call this level, level one action. Now one could, of course, um, ask for a little bit more. So if you have a level one, if you have a, an action like this, and so this is some um, condition, um, level one action is some condition um, about pairs of elements. Now if you have triple F elements, A, B, C, and G, you can draw the square, V of A, V of B, V of C. This is isotopic to V of A, B, V of C. It's also isotopic to V of A, V of B, C. And these are isotopic to V of A, B, C. So if you choose isotopies um, between V of A, V of B, and V of A, B for every A, B, in your group, it does exist if, if you have a um, homomorphism like this. Then for every triple of, of elements of your group, you can consider uh, this loop. That loop might be trivial or it might not be. Okay, so this, this is the next uh, thing you could ask for. You could ask for, um, you could ask for this loop to be trivial. You could ask for, for a null homotopy of this square. So call that level two 
action, one, one can keep going. So um, for every um, tuple of uh, k plus 1 elements, you can draw a k-dimensional cube. And you want null homotopies for each of the, these. So level infinity action, you just ask, ask for all of these um, at once. And of course, you could ask for and even more. You could ask for just a strict action where, where things just compose on the nose. Okay, so that's um, a little bit, uh, a little bit too much information for us. It turns out that for the, the three manifolds, we're, we're going to consider diffeomorphisms are the, um, the same as homotopy equivalences um, up at the, as as spaces of the, their homotopy equivalent, and um, and the three manifolds are also k pi ones. So. Uh, it turns out um, level two action automatically extends all, all the way up. Okay, so actually, before before we go on to this, let me explain one more thing about why why you would care about this. So, if we have action G acting on M, if we get this. A long, a short, short exact sequence of groups. So pi one of m goes to pi one of m mod g. Orbifold fundamental group here goes to g goes to one. This is if you have a, a strict action. You can ask how much how much of an action do I need to recover this. Um, so, okay, so one, one, one does not get such an exact sequence from a map just to the mapping class group. You, you don't get this um, extension here. For example, um, of, say, Z mod P on the torus by translation. So, so there are lots of these. Okay, actions of Z mod P on the torus by translation okay, are, are distinguished by this, by the ex extension you get here. Um, uh, okay, but, but in terms of um, pi zero of diff, they're of course all the same. But I'll give so. What does one need to get this extension? So all one needs is, is what I've called a, a level two action. So having level two action is enough to get this uh, exact sequence here. So now, uh, now we can now we can conclude the proof. So, so we've smoothed our action everywhere except um, this this um, space A. We cut along these incompressible surfaces, get pieces A sub I. Um, so G fixes these up to isotopy, so we get an action on, on the pieces up to homotopy. Um, as on the previous slide, there, there are many notions of, of action, so let me be, be more precise about what I mean. So uh, Hatcher showed that uh, if you have an incompressible surface 
in a three-manifold, its, its isotopy class um, is contractible. Um, of course, that's not exactly true manifold. Maybe your three-manifold fibers over a circle, but that's the only thing that can go bad. Okay, so that means your, your, um, your action by G doesn't fix the Fij up to isotopy. It doesn't, doesn't fix them on the nose. It fixes them up to isotopy. But by Hatcher, the isotopy is, is unique up to homotopy. So, so in fact, you get uh, what I call the level infinity action. You could call it a strong homotopy action. I don't know actually what the, whether there's a, a correct term for this, but, but let's just call it this. Okay, so now, now all we need to do is we upgrade um, this homotopy action um, to, to, to an honest action. Okay, so, so each of these um, three manifolds, AI, has decomposition uh, by tori, cut along, further cut along tori. Um, so then each piece is either Seifert fibered or a toroidal, and which is, um, and in, in the latter case, Thurston gives you a, a hyperbolic structure. So, uh, for the, if you have a, a action up to homotopy um, on a hyperbolic three manifold, uh, you get um, you get an action by isometries. Um, that's Moss style rigidity for closed hyperbolic three manifolds. Those are not the ones that appear here. The ones that appear here are the ones um, which are geometrically finite and have a um, uh, boundary of higher genus. Um, okay, so, um, so in that case, it's uh, due to Martin. You also appealing to Nielsen realization for surfaces. Um, and Zimmerman showed the, um, showed the uh, this Nielsen realization problem for, for Seifert fibered three manifolds. Okay, so, so what he actually showed is that if, if you have this, um, if, if, you, if you have an, an action um, um, like this, if you have a map to pi zero diff, that doesn't necessarily lift. Um, but if you have an extension like this, that's what you need to do the lift. And the extension is exactly what this action up to homotopy is giving you. Okay, so, so putting the pieces together, um, now you have a smooth action of G on M. Of course, on each of the pieces, it could be, you have no control of, over how close it is to the original action. All we know is that um, it has the same action on pi naught of the pieces, and, but that's fine because we made the pieces very small. Okay, so that's, that's the end.